Margot Robbie is one of the hottest stars on the planet right now, in more ways than one. The beautiful Aussie actress is in high demand in Hollywood after a string of impressive performances in movies like The Wolf of Wall Street, Suicide Squad, Goodbye Christopher Robin, and I, Tonya. And as much as everyone knows she's very talented, there's more to Robbie than just being an A-list star. In this video, we'll take a look at some interesting facts about her personal life. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It's the best way of keeping up to date with all of Screen Rant's great new videos. We're investing in Italy. Not Italy, California, baby. Oh, California! Her husband was her housemate. Margot Robbie has been married since December of 2016 to British assistant director Tom Ackerley. The couple met on the set of 2015's romantic World War II drama movie Sweet Francais. But pretty much everyone knows that. What isn't widely known is that the pair were housemates before they became romantically involved with one another. Sweet Francais' cast and crew formed a strong bond with one another, so seven of them agreed to move in together in Clapham in southwest London. A year into their house share, Robbie and Ackerley began dating and they actually hid their relationship from their other housemates for quite some time, before they were left with no choice but to make it known. What did Tarzan do? He killed his only son. She loves animals. Margot Robbie loves animals, and back in February of 2016, she and Tom Ackerley introduced their new puppy, Boo Radley, to the world. Little Boo was a rescue pup and was first shown off by Robbie on Instagram, where the tiny guy was seen making himself comfortable on a giant beanbag chair. Robbie also had a pet rat called Rat Rat. Rat Rat was originally a weird gift of sorts, sent by Jared Leto during the filming of Suicide Squad, in which he played the Joker opposite Robbie's Harley Quinn. But she took to the road and gave him a home, including a small rat mansion. However, However, when her then landlord discovered Rat Rat, she was forced to give him up to none other than Guillermo del Toro. Or else. Oh. I was gonna say I wouldn't do that if I were you. She turned down Playboy magazine. It goes without saying that the idea of seeing Margot Robbie in any state of undress is very appealing to millions of men, and indeed women around the world. Therefore, any edition of Playboy featuring the gorgeous star would undoubtedly fly off the shelves en masse. It's never going to happen though, so get that idea out of your head right now. Robbie turned down the world-famous publication because she'll only ever go naked for artistic purposes, and in her own words, she has put her family through enough. Apparently, when she appeared nude in 2013's The Wolf of Wall Street, those closest to her really didn't like it. It remains to be seen whether or not she'll do any more scenes of that nature in the future. Nikki. Let me have it. Nikki, if we just ran, if we just... You know, if I can slip away or if we can... She can't say home in different accents. Margot Robbie is an incredibly talented actress, and in spite of the fact she's from Australia, she successfully portrayed characters from the likes of New York, in the case of Naomi LaPaglia and Harley Quinn, Oregon, in the case of Tonya Harding, and England, in the case of Lady Greystoke and, and Daphne Milne. It pretty much goes without saying, therefore, that she's generally very good at covering up her Australian accent, but there is one word that she really has a hard time saying correctly in any accent but her own. The word in question is home, and poor Margot really struggles to make it sound anything other than Australian. Can you say home in a different accent? Let us know in the comments. And after a while, I just realized it didn't. Her nickname is Maggot. She's beautiful, she's talented, she's popular, and you could use countless other superlatives to describe her. So you'd expect Margot Robbie to have a pretty cool nickname, right? Wrong. Robbie's nickname is actually Maggot. Yes, really. And believe it or not, it has nothing to do with schoolyard bullying or anything negative. It's actually an affectionate term for the star, as it's a nickname that was given to her by her own family. The name grew on her throughout her school years when her classmates got in on the joke too, but as we said before, it was never meant in a derogatory way. So, it's all good. We're going to Monaco! Monaco? Christina Ritchie was her roommate. In 2011, Margot Robbie moved to Hollywood, where her first major role would end up being in the critically acclaimed television series Pan Am, which followed the exploits of the pilots and stewardesses of the titular airline as it operated in the early 1960s. Robbie landed one of the lead roles in the show alongside the Addams Family star Christina Ritchie. Both actresses played stewardesses, and they actually roomed together during their time working alongside each other. In fact, during this time, when they were made to wear 60s retro super tight girdles, it was Richie who would regularly help Robbie to wrestle into her incredibly awkward costume. I was a kid. Did you ever love me or anything? 
she has a strange diet. Anyone who looks at Margot Robbie can immediately see that she has an amazing figure. There's not an ounce of fat on her, her stomach is toned, and she could easily be a swimsuit model. But her regular diet certainly doesn't reflect that. It's hard to believe it, but Robbie has been quoted as saying, I don't have a very good diet, and that she loves beer, fries, and burgers. But she has admitted that if she has to get in a bikini, she'll eat nothing but carrot sticks for three whole days. She's described her diet as one extreme or the other. We bet a lot of people wish they could spend so much time eating so unhealthily and still look as good as Robbie. Feel free to say no. Yeah, sure. I hate to even bring it up. I feel so rude even asking this. No, She's been accused of lying about her age. A lady's age is a sensitive subject, which is why you're told to never ask a lady how old she is. So it must have come as something of a shock to Margot Robbie when she was accused of lying about hers. As of early 2018, Robbie is 27 years old, but a number of people have been somewhat suspicious about that number because of a 2008 interview the actress took part in. The print version of said interview stated that she was 23 at the time. If the interview had been correct, she would be 33 by now. However, that claim has since been confirmed to be a journalistic error. You gotta have some reason for being here. What's your reason? What um, is yours? She thought Prince Harry was Ed Sheeran. Back in 2016, Margot Robbie attended a housewarming party for her friend and fellow actress, Sookie Waterhouse. Many famous people were there, including Prince Harry, who Robbie met and followed into a photo booth with a few other people. The problem was, Robbie believed that she was going into the booth with musician Ed Sheeran. They are both ginger after all. She admitted to making the error during an appearance on The Tonight Show, and she was quite embarrassed about it to say the least. British tabloids were quick to suggest that Robbie and the Prince were romantically involved once the photos from the booth were released, but that obviously wasn't the case, given that the star didn't even know who he was. He's not religious, but... That, that church, it was only holy because of what she brought to it. She's a bit of a tomboy. In spite of how beautiful and feminine Margot Robbie obviously is, she's actually something of a self-confessed tomboy. She's very openly not much of a girly girl when it comes to fashion and often ends up wearing shorts, a t-shirt, and a pair of Converse sneakers when she's not working. She describes her style as on the less feminine side and more grungy and edgy. She also likes activities that aren't typically associated with girly girls. For example, she's never happier than when she's surfing, out on the farm hunting wild pigs, building dens out in the paddocks, riding around on motorbikes, or playing on the right wing for her ice hockey team. Playing an iconic supervillain role is no easy task, especially for Margot Robbie, who stole every scene she appeared in for 2016's Suicide Squad. Something tells me a whole lot of people are about to die. The actress was fully committed to performing the part, but there were some pretty strict rules to follow along the way. Learn what it was like for Margot on set, how the director forced her into something on the first day, and what it was like performing with a method actor like Jared Leto. Many of these rules and restrictions transferred over to her role in the upcoming Birds of Prey movie as well. When another actor decides to go all method for a role, there's not really much you can do. <laughs> This was definitely the case for Margot Robbie in Suicide Squad. As Jared Leto shaved his whole body and transformed into the Joker, Margot Robbie was forced to go along for the ride, pretty much abiding by the rules and standards Leto set to get into character. One of the main rules? No rehearsals. Yep. Despite getting some scenes alongside Will Smith and rehearsing everything else with the rest of the squad, Robbie went blind into her scenes with the Joker, so Leto and director David Ayer could try and capture the unpredictable nature of the dysfunctional duo. Ah, if you weren't so crazy, I'd think you were insane. This means that Margot had to pretty much switch up her whole preparation and the way she would approach scenes. Another aspect of Leto's method acting routine? The random gifts he would leave for the cast. Along with some adult toys and the body of a pig, Margot Robbie got her own personal gift in the form of a living rat. I smell a rat. At least Robbie was a good sport about it, actually keeping the rat as a pet and naming it Rat Rat. Harley Quinn was first introduced in Batman the Animated Series, and her voice was one of the more iconic parts of the show. Right away, Mr. J. To get inspiration, Robbie watched and listened to several scenes of Harley Quinn on the Batman animated series, but also found some inspiration through the classic mob flick Goodfellas. Specifically, she tuned into the accent and voice of the character Karen Hill. Hey. Do you love her? Do you? 
Robbie took all of the scenes with Karen Hill, had them converted to audio, and would play them back over and over on her way to the set. The key aspect of Robbie's delivery was being able to deliver emotional scenes without getting too high-pitched or not taken seriously enough for the role. At the end of the day, her unique voice and acting choices were one of the most praised parts of the movie. We're bad guys. It's what we do. While the animated version of Harley Quinn typically wore a full jumpsuit, things would be very different in a live-action setting. The final costume design was inspired by more mature comic books rather than the character from an animated show aimed at children. Margot Robbie was essentially forced to wear shorts that were so short they would barely even qualify as underwear. As a newbie to the world of comic book movies, Robbie did not have authority in her outfit choice, a costume design she wishes was very different. Not only did Robbie have to perform in the tight-fitting outfit, but the actress often did her own stunts while wearing the short shorts. There were some flashbacks where she wore different outfits and got to cover up more, but the shorts and t-shirt combo was pretty much a majority of what she had to wear on set. Thankfully for Robbie, the popularity of her character led to some pretty pivotal outfit changes for the upcoming Birds of Prey movie. Robbie has been seen in trailers and on set in longer pants. Those shorts are probably never going to be seen on Robbie again if she can help it. Underneath the Harley Quinn outfit, Margot Robbie was forced to go through all types of preparation just to get her skin ready for the character. Harley Quinn doesn't seem to get much sunlight because her pale skin is a vast difference from other characters in the movie. Robbie's natural skin was not this pale, meaning she had to go through a full body routine in the makeup trailer every day. The routine was so extensive that just a single scene showing a bare arm would require the actress to have another 20 minutes getting her skin prepared. Along with her skin getting painted white, Quinn is all tatted up, with around 20 temporary tattoos in total. Each new day on set, Robbie would have to have the tattoos applied again, with makeup artists ensuring they were in the same exact location to match up with filming. After her skin preparation, she needed to have the wig added on, along with the full Harley Quinn outfit. The whole process could take over three hours, sometimes even longer than Jared Leto's preparation for the Joker. The daily makeup chair wasn't the only transformation Robbie went through to get into the role of Harley Quinn. On the very first day of filming, director David Ayer did something drastic when he approached Robbie and decided to just shave her eyebrow. He, he cut a chunk out of my eyebrow. The look could be easily noticed in the movie, and it was just another quirky part of the character. We imagine Robbie could have easily said no, but to get asked to do that on the very first day of filming, Robbie probably had a lot of pressure to oblige. Yeah, that was gangster. The end result works great for the film, and her eyebrows are fully grown out by now. She was happy to tell the story, and seems to have no regrets about it. In Suicide Squad, one of the key scenes used to introduce Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn was a chase scene involving Ben Affleck's Batman. But their high-speed chase was not a success. The car plummeted into water, and Quinn was launched through the windshield on the way down. Batman attempts to rescue Quinn, and we see her trapped underwater for a pretty long time. For Robbie, filming the scene required her to go through extensive breath-holding training. The production set a guideline for one minute, but Robbie pushed her limits, fully training to hold her breath underwater for a whole five minutes. Now that's commitment to the part! And learning the underwater techniques is no easy task either. Robbie did multiple weeks of training to learn how to properly hold in air, expand her lungs, and to psychologically handle being in the water for so long. To get into the role of Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie had to get into some of the best shape of her life. Her goal was to slim down, put on a little muscle, and fit into the costume. So to help prepare, Robbie focused on a lot of cardio workouts. Aside from running, the workout routine also included a lot of squats and crunches. Working with a professional trainer, Robbie did full workout routines to help tone her body. Some of the exercises included jump ropes, resistance pulls, and wearing heavy ankle weights to help tone her whole bottom half. Robbie also found a lot of inspiration through ballet training. She mixed in dances, stretches, and a variety of exercises ballet dancers will commonly use while they train. The workouts began months before filming and continued through the production to ensure she stayed fit and toned throughout the shoot. As production ramped up for Birds of Prey, Robbie followed the same routine to help stay in shape to return to her famous role. Thankfully, the productions of Birds of Prey and James Gunn's Suicide Squad were not too far apart, so Robbie just continued down the same path as before. 
Along with the workout routine, Robbie had a pretty strict diet heading into the Suicide Squad production. For Robbie, the diet may have been the hardest part considering she loves to eat burgers and fries all the time. When it came down to get really strict with the diet, Robbie munched on a bunch of carrot sticks. This was often her go-to snack for having a treat and staying healthy. The balance of food Robbie dieted on allowed her to sneak in plenty of cheat meals while filming, including the burgers she loves so much. The last thing she wants to do is skip out on her favorite food options just to shed a few pounds or look a specific way for a role. We have to imagine that with a diet so strict, all those lollipops Harley Quinn has in the movie are most likely sugar-free. Otherwise, she'd be swapping out the lollipop for some extra carrot sticks between takes. One of the unwritten rules for playing a major character in a big-budget film like Suicide Squad? Your life will change forever. Robbie's transformation into Harley Quinn came with all kinds of bonuses. She's in two more movies. Margot Robbie has her own action figure. There's posters, merch, and the character will live on forever. But so will some of the toxic fans who make her life a nightmare. In the months following the film's release, Robbie quickly realized the real-life downfall of starring in a superhero movie. When she began getting threats from obsessed fans, Robbie had to increase security, get background checks on some of the crazed fans, and often had to pay out of pocket for the extra support. This is one of the biggest regrets she has going into the role and an unwritten rule when it comes to playing an iconic character like Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn! Despite the negative aspect of fandom, Robbie obviously found some positive aspects of the role as well, because she's happily doing multiple sequels and ready to make Harley Quinn all her own once again. We imagine the much larger paycheck will help cover a lot of the security costs and reduce stalker threats. For the role of Harley Quinn, there were a ton of rules for the specific character, but Margot Robbie also had to follow a lot of the general DCEU rules. There have been many rules and rumored guidelines about the DCEU over the years. Funnily enough, Margot Robbie's role as Harley Quinn has helped break a number of these rules. Before Suicide Squad, one of the main rules was a no-joke policy based off the joke-filled Green Lantern movie that failed at the box office. As Harley Quinn, the Suicide Squad movie was filled with a ton of lighthearted moments, so we have to say that the old DCEU rule pretty much went away with the release of the movie. Now that's killer out. Another important DCEU rule? No crossing over with Marvel. If you're active in the DCEU, you can't be popping up in the MCU, and so far Margot Robbie has stuck to her DC roots. One of the biggest rules Robbie has helped break is the R rating rule. The first Suicide Squad could have been a much better movie with an R rating, but things will be very different for Birds of Prey when Harley Quinn and company fly in with an R rating. Thanks to films like Joker, Warner Brothers is now more open to the R rating, and Birds of Prey could really help bring more mature comic book movies going forward. Margot Robbie is one of the most acclaimed and coveted actresses working in Hollywood today. She can go from the superhero genre to the Oscar crowd pleaser like it's nobody's business. But there's more to the Australian actress than just good looks and acting, and a lot of it may actually surprise you. The Legend of Tarzan starred some very attractive people, namely Margot Robbie and her leading man-ape Alexander Skarsgård. The two played the iconic Tarzan and Jane from the old Victorian novels in this film adaptation, which takes place after the events of the typical films like Disney's Tarzan. Naturally, the two are married in the film, and thus get a steamy scene together. Now, with Tarzan being a character who grew up in the wild, he can get a primal from time to bed. Especially in bed. Director David Yates didn't want Jane to be overpowered, so he instructed Robbie to either punch or slap Skarsgård during their scene together. Only Robbie full-on decked him in the face and actually left a mark on the leading man. Talk about getting into the scene! Despite all the action in the film, Yates stated that the scene was likely the only one to cause physical harm to an actor on set. When the marketing for Suicide Squad kicked off, many fans instantly gravitated towards Margot Robbie's portrayal of Harley Quinn. She seemed to instantly capture the charm and crazy that has made the character so beloved with fans. But Robbie was initially not too jazzed about playing her. Citing her bizarre obsession with the Joker, who constantly abuses her, Robbie was confused about Harley as a character. But once she did some research on codependence and read Fool for Love, she was able to understand her more and gave the highlight performance of the film. She was so good, in fact, she's getting her own spin-off film titled Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Quite the title. There's also talks of a Joker and Harley spin-off film and a Gotham City Sirens. And you can't forget she'll likely be back for Suicide Squad 2, which will be co-written by James Gunn. 
In one sequence in Suicide Squad, Harley and Joker get rammed underwater by Batman, and the actress found herself submerged underwater. Filming underwater sequences isn't terribly hard these days, with the use of stunt doubles and CGI to get the job done. But Robbie was having none of that. She actually worked with a free diver for the scene and learned how to hold her breath for the whole scene. In fact, she was able to hold her breath for around five minutes by the time she was ready to shoot the scene. Talk about going above and beyond for a small moment in the film. Robbie states that the talent has now become her new party trick. Perhaps one day we'll see her in an underwater movie where she can really show off those skills. Harley and Aquaman 2, anyone? Changing and maintaining one's body weight is a common concern for Hollywood actors. They often go through rigorous transformations, or are told they have to maintain a certain weight in order to be more desirable for various parts. While it's no secret Margot Robbie doesn't look like she needs help in the health department, she actually puts her own body image first, and not what the film dictates she has to have. Case in point, The Legend of Tarzan. She actually refused to drop her body weight for the role, something you don't hear about often in Hollywood. The real reason for this decision? It was her first time filming in England, and Robbie wanted to hit pubs whenever possible. She was able to convince the studio execs that a Victorian lady wouldn't have looked like a supermodel anyway, and she won her case and, hopefully, proceeded to the nearest pub immediately. Harley is certifiably crazy and plays a big part in Suicide Squad, but the drive to do something crazy carried over to Margot's real life on the set of the DCEU film. She decided to take up tattooing her fellow cast members when the cameras weren't rolling, despite not being experienced in the craft. She would tattoo the word squad intentionally miswritten as S-K-W-A-D, but Margot's career as a part-time tattooist sort of kicked off to a bad start when she actually botched her first tattoo on a cast assistant named Simon. His tattoo, while you Unique spells SWAD instead. Perhaps that's why Joel Kinnaman opted to have Will Smith do his tattoo instead. Director David Ayer couldn't resist poking fun at the typo and made an appropriately funny post on Twitter. But hey, at least she tried something new. Margot Robbie can seemingly play it all, and 2018 saw her tackle the historical genre by portraying Queen Elizabeth I in the film Mary Queen of Scots. The film is a retelling of the events that saw Mary Stuart trying to overthrow her cousin Queen Elizabeth. Despite the rich history and interesting characters, Robbie actually almost turned it down. Despite being an acclaimed actress, Robbie actually felt like she didn't deserve the role, and that there were better actresses out there who would be much better in portraying Queen Elizabeth I. The reason for this belief was that Robbie didn't go to university university or drama school, and she believed that in order to play such a historical figure, you needed a classical education, and that she wasn't in the same league as former Elizabeth actresses Kate Blanchett or Judi Dench. But she took the role, and is getting award buzz for her performance. After leaving her acting career in Australia behind, Robbie moved to the United States seeking to break into mainstream Hollywood. After landing a small part in About Time, she landed an audition in an upcoming Martin Scorsese film called The Wolf of Wall Street, which, as we know, stars Leonardo DiCaprio. Way to hit the ground running, Margot! Unlike Suicide Squad, which saw the role of Harley Quinn be offered to her, she had to audition for Wolf, as she was virtually unknown stateside. So how do you impress one of the greatest directors of all time as an unknown when you're standing next to Leo. Well, because her audition was the scene where she and Leo fight, she hit Leo really hard. She actually thought her career was over and that the studio would press charges, but Leo and Martin laughed it off, and Leo even told her to do it again. Despite her supermodel appearance, being in touch with her feminine side isn't something Robbie is particularly good at, the actress states. There's no doubt that Margot Robbie is one of the most beautiful actresses working in Hollywood today, and she can rock any dress on the red carpet. But that's not where she feels the most comfortable. Like most of us, Margot Robbie is more comfortable wearing a pair of Converse and sporting a t-shirt and shorts she can. She says she prefers being grungy and edgy in her appearance, and tries to buy Australian brands for her everyday wear, supporting the country of her birth. We think it's pretty cool that Robbie is so comfortable being down to earth and is proud to wear clothes that we can all relate to. I, Tonya was a critical darling and one of Robbie's best performances, netting her another Oscar nomination and winning the Critics' Choice Award for her portrayal of Tonya Harding, a competitive figure skater in the 90s. Now, figure skating can already be tricky enough, especially when you're emulating the kind of stuff you'd see on the competitive level. But Robbie was actually injured during the production with a herniated disc in her neck. Unfortunately for her, she was also a producer on the film and couldn't back out, so had to complete the shoot, having to check in for an MRI every week to make sure she was okay to film the following week. Not only did she give great skating scenes, but one heck of a performance. 
Being an actor is hard stuff. Not only is there the time commitment of rehearsing and memorizing lines, but there's a fitness regime and diet to follow. And that's just scratching the surface of an actor's life. For superhero roles like Suicide Squad, studios expect their actors to be looking fit, and that requires a hearty and, well, boring diet. But once the production is finished, Robbie is having none of that healthy stuff. She actually loves junk food like the rest of us, and says she'd prefer to have some beer and french fries when she's not required to look the part on screen. But when it's time to look slim, it's carrot sticks for days, she says. That's two very different extremes, but we're glad Robbie can do what makes her happy on the off days. Margot Robbie is an Oscar-nominated actress, superheroine, and celebrity A-lister. She can also add producer to her impressive resume. Along with Tom Ackerley, Josie McNamara, and Sophia Kerr, she's opened and running Lucky Chap Entertainment, a production company that will take care of Robbie's upcoming commitments in film. So far, the company has produced I, Tonya, Terminal, and the upcoming film Dreamland, with more on the way, including Barbed Wire Heart, which is not expected to have Robbie on screen. It'll also likely produce many of Robbie's upcoming pictures, giving the actress more control over the film she's involved in. We know that the company is overseeing Birds of Prey and Gotham City Sirens, and will also be producing a film for Mattel that Robbie will be starring in. Perhaps one day we'll see Robbie accepting a Best Picture award for her productions. They say never judge a book by its cover, and the same can be applied for Margot Robbie. You may not know it by looking at her, but Robbie is actually a pretty fit person. She loves hockey and genuinely enjoys sports. When she was younger, she actively practiced gymnastics as well. That last bit would come in handy when she was cast as Harley Quinn. You know those trapeze scenes in the film? Yeah, that's not a stunt double or CGI character. Robbie did it all herself. In fact, she did most of her own stunts, with producer Andy Horowitz stating Robbie's stunt double more or less relaxed for the duration of the production. It must be easy money being Margot Robbie's stunt double, and we can't wait to see what kind of stunts she brings to future DCEU films. Margot Robbie became a household name seemingly overnight thanks to her breathtaking performance in The Wolf of Wall Street. Despite being a newcomer to Hollywood, Robbie wasn't terribly shy about making a statement and bared it all for the camera on her first major role in Hollywood. But Robbie only did the scene because she felt it's what the character would have done and felt it was an important moment in the film. So, when Hugh Hefner approached Margot Robbie about doing a photo shoot for Playboy, asking for that one from Wolf of Wall Street, she turned him down. Despite the offer of a big paycheck, citing that doing a nude scene for artistic purposes is something she's willing to do. But to bear it on for a magazine has no value creatively, despite not being shy about her body. Margot Robbie consistently is surprising Hollywood, and she continued to do that with the announcement that she will star and produce an upcoming Barbie movie. Barbie has always been something of a controversial toy, with many accusing the doll's proportions of being unrealistic. But Robbie isn't letting the toy's sometimes controversial past get in the way of her production. She's cited that the toy encourages curiosity, confidence, and communication, and is eager to showcase that on film. With Barbie taking on over 150 roles in her shelf time, including including President of the United States and a princess, the world really is Barbie's oyster when Robbie brings her to the big screen. Robbie also promises that the film will have a positive impact on both children and the general audience once it comes out, and will hold her to that promise. The film is scheduled to release in 2020. The turning point for Margot Robbie's career was when she landed the co-starring role in Martin Scorsese's acclaimed film The Wolf of Wall Street. The film was full of A-listers, including Leo, Jonah Hill, Matthew McConaughey, and Kyle Chandler, for instance. But no one really knew who Margot was at the time. But she definitely hit the ground running and went through the ringer for the role. She decided to do a full nude scene, thinking it suited the character better than having her appear in a robe. She also got a slew of paper cuts on her back during her intimate scene with Leo where she's lying on a bed of money. She also accidentally kicked Leo in the face during the infamous heel-on-face scene. Despite the nerves and scars, the role was a huge turning point for Robbie. Jan Russ was the casting agent for Neighbors, an Australian soap opera. In 2008, Russ started to receive phone calls. Every day for weeks, a teenaged girl would call Russ's office and ask to speak with her. As luck would have it, Russ happened to be casting for the part of a 17-year-old. She reluctantly agreed to meet the teenaged caller. Shortly after, Margot Robbie made her first appearance on Neighbors, setting her on the path to Hollywood stardom. After a few years, Robbie abandoned her character, Donna, asking the producers to kill her off. 
Robbie was moving to America in hopes of becoming a movie star. She was told that her character would survive, and it would be explained that Donna was leaving Australia to attend school. Robbie elaborated on a recent episode of Hot Ones. Because they said, well, you know, if things don't work out in America, we want you to be able to come back and play the role again. So my character also moved to America. Incidentally, I guess she's still there because I haven't been back on the show. Robbie was determined not to come back. In this video, we'll be taking you through Margot Robbie's career in Hollywood and what drives her astronomical ambitions. Because just like many of her characters, Robbie is tough, hardworking, and driven to define herself on her own terms. And that journey kicked off with her breakout role in a movie called The Wolf of Wall Street. Soon after landing a role in the short-lived drama Pan Am, Robbie was made aware that Martin Scorsese was auditioning actresses for a part in a new film. The part was described in the movie's screenplay as the hottest blonde ever. With all of New York auditioning, Robbie figured she didn't have a chance. She sent in a tape anyway. Scorsese's longtime casting director, Ellen Lewis, who cast many of Scorsese's iconic female characters, saw something in Robbie's tape. Scorsese called her into test with Leonardo DiCaprio. As she stepped into the audition, Robbie was petrified. At 22, she was only a few years removed from the teenager she had played on Neighbors, and here she was auditioning for the part of a lifetime with Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. As Robbie recounts it, DiCaprio started improvising, confusing her. She said that she looked at him weird. Leo's like, what's that look for? And then I realized he's ad-libbing, she said in an interview. DiCaprio was yelling, intimidating Robbie. Robbie started screaming, struggling to keep up. DiCaprio went back to the script. Now get over here and kiss me, he said. He pulled Robbie over. In the script, Robbie's character was supposed to do just that, kiss him. But Robbie was in a frenzy. You have 30 seconds left in this room, and if you don't do something impressive, then nothing will ever come of it, she thought. Instead of kissing him, Robbie slapped him across the face for real, and swore at him. The room fell silent. Robbie worried that she'd be charged with assault, but Scorsese and DiCaprio started laughing. Soon after, she had the role. The role was Naomi, the embattled wife of DiCaprio's Jordan Belfort. When Robbie read the script, she was quickly able to get a read on the character. Unlike Robbie, Naomi was a manipulator, able to seduce the powerful men around her into giving her what she wanted. But she had something in common with Robbie. Naomi was a hustler. Robbie was raised in rural Queensland, Australia. In interviews, she still seems hesitant to discuss the details, not wanting to play into Australian stereotypes. But she had a true outback upbringing, with snakes and other wildlife occasionally invading her home. Quoted in a Vanity Fair profile, she said, People always want to know, did you have kangaroos outside your bedroom window? I'm like, yes, but none of my other friends did. Robbie was estranged from her father and raised by her single mother, Sari, who worked as a physiotherapist. Sari supported Robbie and her three siblings, and when Margot was a teen, she began working three jobs in order to contribute. Robbie cleaned houses, worked at a surf shop, and put in hours at Subway as a sandwich artist. Robbie was a perfectionist from the very beginning. Because I you know, would really spread everything out to the edges, the right amount of everything. Took it seriously. Yeah, and now when I go to Subway and someone just kind of like throws it on right in the middle, like I just, it kills me. Like I actually don't go that often anymore because I watch them make it badly and I'm, I'm upset. After appearing in a few low budget films, Robbie moved to big city Melbourne in an attempt to kickstart her acting career. After weeks of couch surfing, she finally pestered Jan Russ into a neighbor's audition. Even behind the scenes of the show, Robbie's competitiveness was on full display. A male crew member joked that he could eat more spaghetti than she could, and Robbie challenged him to an eating contest. Robbie won. And at the end of it, I had eaten 1.8 kilos of spaghetti bolognese, which is equivalent to four pounds. <laughs> no way. When she was called back to set, Robbie was unable to move. A nurse had to induce vomiting. Later that day, Robbie was shooting again. Against her Australian agent's wishes, Robbie recounted this gross bolognese story to an American agent. The agent decided to represent her. I like to think that they saw Robbie's drive in that story. They saw someone who wouldn't take no for an answer. And if they did, they were right. During her prep for Wolf of Wall Street, Robbie wanted to master Naomi's Brooklyn accent. She studied the differences between accents in different neighborhoods within Brooklyn and tried to piece together how the accent would change with her character's psychology. Stop flexing your muscles, Jordan. You look like a f***ing imbecile. 
Quoted in an interview at the time, she said, I also wanted to have made a conscious effort to pull down the Brooklyn from the accent. I wanted her to be aware of the fact that she was hanging out with people with a lot of money, and she would be a little embarrassed of her original humble beginnings. In an interview around the release of the movie, Robbie beams about how impressed Brooklyn natives are with her accent work. She also said this, which I thought was pretty funny. My mum's from Brooklyn, and I can't do her accent, her original accent. She's really? sort of a bit more English which part now. Of Brooklyn? Um, you know what? I'm not even entirely sure. It's a big place, isn't You're it? You're a bad son. Do you have a... Oh, tr thanks. <laughs> Robbie is obviously joking, but it does speak to the amount of research she did for the film. Whatever neighborhood the interviewer would have answered, I'm sure Robbie would have had something to say about it. Another challenge of the film were the many nude scenes, particularly a now infamous scene between Robbie and DiCaprio in a baby's nursery. The scene, which has graphic nudity and depicts acts where the consent is ambiguous, took 17 hours to shoot. During those 17 hours, Robbie was surrounded by an entirely male crew. Robbie notes this in interviews close to the film's release, but since she is still essentially promoting the movie, she can't really say anything too negative about it. From a purely outsider, speculative perspective, I would guess that the experience rattled Robbie a little and may have motivated some of her decisions later on. Unfortunately, this would not be Robbie's last encounter with a difficult work environment, because a few years after Wolf, Margot Robbie made Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad was written and directed by David Ayer, a guy who kicked off his career with the screenplay for Training Day. Training Day is an uber-masculine cop thriller about violent men committing violent acts. It was a critical and commercial success, and Ayer followed it up with a dozen other movies about violent men committing violent acts. I know very little about Ayer personally, but publicly, I feel that he's always gone out of his way to prove that he was tough. He famously shouted this at a Comic-Con panel. And he promised a DC movie that would be a gritty, serious alternative to the poppy Marvel Cinematic Universe. On set, Ayer sought to get his cast members into the headspaces of the supervillains they would be playing. During rehearsals, Ayer pitted the cast, who included Robbie as the hellion Harley Quinn, Will Smith, Jai Courtney, and more against each other, forcing them to argue and reveal dark truths about themselves. He even coaxed them into fistfights. I had them fight each other. You learn a lot about who a person really is when you punch them in the face. It gets rid of a lot of the actor stuff, Ayer said later. Robbie discussed the process in interviews. If there's ever tension, I try to diffuse the tension, and that's just a natural reaction for me. Where for Harley, it's the complete opposite. And I felt so awful, and so many times we did, like, these scenes, and I was just saying awful things. And seeing that someone's struggling with something in particular, and David's looking at me, like, you better get in there, that's your window of opportunity right there. Take it. Not everyone was as uncomfortable in the environment. Infamously, Jared Leto, while method acting as the Joker, sent obscene and threatening gifts to the other cast members, including adult toys, bullets, and to Robbie, a rat. Leto also ordered one of his henchmen to walk into a rehearsal and drop a dead pig on a table. Leto stayed in character, constantly antagonizing crew members and scaring the cast. Ayer and Leto created a sort of intensity arms race, and many of the other cast members joined in. Adewale Akineye Agbaji, who played the man-eating killer Croc, listened to recordings of famous cannibals while in makeup. Under Ayer's instruction, Cara Delevingne, who played the witch enchantress, went into a forest and danced naked under the full moon. Jai Courtney, playing Captain Boomerang, who, may I add, is a comic book character who robs banks with trick boomerangs, stubbed lit cigarettes out on his own arms. On top of all of that, much of the cast, including Robbie, got squad tattoos, reaffirming their commitment to the movie. This isn't really important to this documentary, but Robbie did some of the tattoos herself and even misspelled one of them on Jai Courtney's assistant. Well, well, everyone was spelling word. it as S-K-W-A-D, yeah. but I went straight from the S to the W. Swad? <laughs> So not only do many famous actors have Squad tattooed on them because of this movie, there is a guy walking around with Squad permanently written on his body because he just happened to be working for Jai Courtney. Anyway, V-Production wasn't the only troubled thing during the making of Suicide Squad. Before shooting, 
Ayer was given only six weeks to work on the script, in the hopes that he could cobble the story together during production. In post-production, the movie was recut by the company who made the trailer, because the trailer had been popular, and the studio was worried the finished film was too different. The movie was also extensively reshot. Most movies spend between six and ten million dollars on reshoots. Suicide Squad spent 22. As you may already know, while Suicide Squad was a pretty big hit, it was savaged by critics and largely rejected by moviegoers. While it still undoubtedly has its fans, the movie and Leto's method antics have quickly become a pop culture punchline. So what does this have to do with Margot Robbie? Well, here I have to get a little bit speculative. Just like with Wolf of Wall Street, most of the existing interviews of Robbie talking about Suicide Squad were conducted in order to promote Suicide Squad. On top of that, the series is ongoing, and Robbie isn't really able to speak negatively about the experience. But I don't think it's much of a leap to suggest that Robbie was unhappy about the way her character was portrayed. And to talk about that, I have to talk about Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn debuted in Batman the Animated Series in 1992 because the Joker needed a new henchman. But due to her unique design and personality, Harley Quinn, as voiced by Arlene Sorkin, quickly became a fan favorite. One of the most unique elements of her character came from her relationship with the Joker. The famous and controversial comic book story Mad Love portrayed this relationship as abusive. In this disturbing origin story, Harley was a psychiatrist who fell for the Joker and pursued him despite his mistreatment. The story was adapted into an episode of the animated series, pushing the boundaries of what could be explored in a children's cartoon. Since the 90s, this dynamic has been one of the core elements of the character across all media. Harley is a survivor of abuse, and with a few recent exceptions, at the end of most of her stories, she goes back to the Joker. Suicide Squad portrays this dynamic, but doesn't really dig into it. In some scenes, Joker is scary and manipulative. In others, we're led to believe he cares for Harley. The film ends with Joker breaking Harley out of prison, a scene that is played as triumphant. This isn't the only way the movie goes out of its way to degrade Robbie and her character. It opens with her being tortured by guards, and the other members of the squad routinely threaten her with violence in a distinctly gendered way. I will knock your ass out. I do not care that you're a girl. Additionally, many critics pointed out the gross way Ayer's camera lingers on her body and the fetishistic nature of Harley's costumes. My point is not to dump on Suicide Squad, just to back up my belief that the totality of the experience, from Ayer's bizarre work environment, to the poor reception of the film, to the portrayal of Harley herself, galvanized something in Robbie. As she had always been, Robbie was ambitious, and just like Harley, she wanted control of her own destiny. Robbie had more than proven that she was a star, and from now on, she would be calling the shots. This is where Lucky Chap Entertainment comes in. When Margot Robbie was a teenager, she'd listen to music with her best friend Sophia Kerr. They could never agree on what to listen to, but on one topic, they were united. They both wanted to work in the movies. When Robbie moved to America, Kerr became her assistant. In 2014, Robbie, Kerr, Robbie's husband Tom Ackerley, and filmmaker friend Josie McNamara, all roommates at the time, decided to form Lucky Chap Entertainment. The company has produced vehicles for Robbie and other projects centering female filmmakers. In 2016, shortly after the release of Suicide Squad, Lucky Chap signed a first look deal at Warner Brothers. This means that Robbie and her team see any relevant project before anyone else. In other words, Robbie is, more than almost any actress her age, in control of what she's able to do. Through Lucky Chap, Robbie produced I, Tanya about controversial figure skater Tanya Harding. The film was a very sympathetic view of Harding and portrays her as a victim of both the abusive men around her and the unsympathetic media. The role nabbed Robbie an Oscar nomination and was a box office success, and the hits kept on coming. Two years later, Robbie landed another massive role, one that had been a dream for a long time. When Robbie married Ackerley in 2016, guests may have been confused about the odd music she had chosen to walk down the aisle to, but any movie buffs in the audience might have recognized it. True Romance? Mm -hmm. Great Tony Scott. Really? I walked down the aisle right? to the True Romance music. Come on. What? Oh, that's good. The movie chronicles the relationship between petty criminal Clarence and sex worker Alabama, who escape gangsters and the police in search of a better life. It's easy to see why Alabama, as played by Patricia Arquette, appeals to Robbie, a platinum blonde who escapes her abusive pimp and overpowers a gangster who assaults her. 
Alabama feels like the blueprint for some of Robbie's most iconic characters. True Romance was the first studio movie for screenwriter Quentin Tarantino. The success of the film, as well as Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs, guaranteed the director a career in Hollywood. And Hollywood, as a place and as a concept, was the focus of his next film. When Robbie first met with her American team, they asked her what her dream project would be. She said, Pie in the Sky, Tarantino. Robbie sent a letter to the director, telling him she was a big fan and that she would love to participate in any of his films. Tarantino cast her as Sharon Tate in his 1960s LA odyssey, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Much has been criticized about Robbie's role in the film, not so much to do with her performance, but Tate's lack of dialogue and the way that Tarantino shoots her. But it is my humble opinion that even with those factors, Robbie's performance is deeply affecting, and the scene where Tate goes to see her own movie is one of the highlights of the film. But I would argue that Robbie's ultimate creative vision arrived three years later, in the form of Birds of Prey. After Suicide Squad, Robbie was given the keys to the kingdom in regards to her character. She reacted by reinventing her completely. Robbie decided she would develop and produce a new film. It was quickly announced that Harley Quinn would headline a girl gang movie, something Robbie thought was missing from the genre. She hired Kathy Yan, a relatively unknown director coming off an acclaimed Sundance debut. Then she hired Bumblebee screenwriter Christina Hodson to write the script. The results, even in production stills and trailers, were immediately noticeable. That's what happens when you have a female producer, director, writer, the movie's costume designer, Aaron Benack, said in an interview. Gone were Harley's Hot Topic outfits, replaced by bright, pastel-colored ensembles that could have been lifted from the closet of True Romance's Alabama. In the hands of Robbie's female-fronted crew, Quinn became a true rarity in blockbuster films, a uniquely female loser. The setup of the film is relatively simple. Harley has been dumped by the Joker, who never appears in the movie, and as a result, every criminal in Gotham is after her. Chief among them is Roman Sionis, aka the Black Mask, a gangster who wants control of both Gotham in general, and more specifically, Harley. To defeat Sionis, Quinn has to unite a disparate group of fighting women, the Birds of Prey, who put aside their differences and work together. As star and producer, Robbie's fingerprints are all over the movie. Yan may have directed the film, and Hansen may have written it, but Birds of Prey feels willed into existence by its star. The movie has so many of the themes that have hallmarked Robbie's work that it starts to feel like the emancipation of the title refers to Robbie herself. Harley is looking to define herself on her own terms, and that's the kind of superhero story that I imagine would appeal to a child of a single mother. Someone who worked three jobs to support herself and called into a soap opera every day to jumpstart her acting career. Furthermore, Harley's kinship with the Birds of Prey might connect to someone who started a production company with her childhood best friend. Someone who was able to assemble a team of women to make the action movie she always wanted to see. Harley Quinn might not have been the role that Margot Robbie dreamed of playing as a kid in the Australian Outback, but somehow it was the role she was born to play. And I think the secret to her success is that behind the glamorous movie star, the scrappy Outback kid is still visible in Robbie's performances. And from the outside at least, it looks like that kid is having fun. It's no secret that if you're gonna be in a superhero movie, you have to get in shape, and Margot Robbie for Harley Quinn was no different. In this video, we will take a look at her intense workout routine, which she uses to stay in shape, uh -huh. the balanced but sometimes relaxed diet she sticks to, and how she pulled off one insane stunt for real in the Suicide Squad. Let's take a look. Now, when preparing for a superhero role, most actors decide to bulk up in the gym. Just take Chris Hemsworth and those glistening abs, for example. But surprisingly, Margot Robbie actually stays away from the gym. I mean, me too, but A, I'm lazy, and B, I don't look half as good as Margot Robbie or Chris Hemsworth for that matter. But then again, does anyone look as good as Hemi? While Robbie did venture into the gym on occasion for the 2016 Suicide Squad movie, and did find the boxing sessions and fight practice pretty fun, she quickly found out lifting weights wasn't for her. Of course though, she still does have her very own workout routine, and she works extensively with her trainer, Andy Hecker, to keep her abs impeccable while remaining petite, and works out for two to three hours a day, five days a week, while working on a role like the Suicide Squad. 
Her workout is apparently very intense and is at the same level as a highly trained athlete. This routine includes around 100 sit-ups a day, along with ab-centric exercises such as planks, hip dips, and pikes, which I'm led to believe are all real things. For her lower body, Robbie would perform some ballet and bar-inspired, non-bulking leg exercises to sculpt her inner and outer thighs, doing some trampoline jumps, big circle leg rotations, double leg lifts, and tricep extensions. Robbie also makes sure to do some lengths at the pool and will swim for at least 45 minutes. Away from the intense workout routine, Robbie also does other forms of exercise with a great love of Pilates, while also playing lots of tennis, dancing, and judging by her reactions, watching Rangers games. But it's not just all working out and exercising. Robbie also makes sure she gets enough sleep and makes sure her room is as sleep friendly as possible so she can switch off and take her mind off of work. To unwind, Robbie will put on a face mask, put on some scented candles, and listen to relaxing music, before taking a bath with lots of bubbles and cracking open a cold one, which rumor has it is actually the very same workout routine that Chris Hemsworth did for his rockin' dad bod in Avengers Endgame. Staying in shape isn't all about working out though, and of course, you also have to maintain a balanced, healthy diet, something which Robbie is no stranger to. That means while preparing for a roll, she will purge herself of all unhealthy food and drinks, aka the good stuff, getting rid of chocolate, soda, fast food, and saturated fats from her diet completely. But having said that, she also knows the importance of cheating every now and then, having a few glasses of wine or a pint of beer, and when she isn't shooting, she will be living the pure American lifestyle chowing down on a burger, with her reportedly also being a fan of the double truffle burger from Umami Burger. When it comes down to her diet when preparing for the Suicide Squad though, it's all basically clean living, with her starting off her breakfast with porridge before later having an immune boost green smoothie. For the rest of the day, Robbie keeps her diet balanced, making sure to have plenty of protein and veg, with her having a salad with lemon and chicken for lunch, while dinner sees her usually having fish, such as a tuna steak, with sweet potato and roasted vegetables. You know what, maybe the staying in shape thing isn't all that bad. All of this hard work and exercise pays off impressively for Robbie, as it not only keeps her in great shape, Gracias but allows her to pull off her own stunts, such as the key trick in The Suicide Squad. The scene in question sees Harley Quinn, who is in chains and handcuffed from the ceiling, strangle the guard to death with her legs, before using her feet to unlock herself. According to James Gunn, Robbie did that stunt for real and was apparently insistent on doing it herself. Gunn was initially planning on cutting in a stunt double, but Robbie told him that she was pretty sure she could do it on her own. On Jimmy Kimmel Live, Gunn said that she is like a human Swiss army knife. She is like a human Swiss army knife. And watching the scene with her flipping backwards was just beyond incredible. I was so happy that it worked out and I was mesmerized by it. However, it's not just because Robbie has a really strong core that allowed her to do the stunt, but the fact that she has equally talented toes. With her saying, I'm ambidextrous with my toes. I could braid someone's hair with my toes, I reckon. Uh, I reckon I could play the piano or whatever. Apparently, Gunn's one regret with the scene is that the big dress she is wearing actually covers her face, so you can't see that it's actually Robbie doing it and not a stunt double. But now you know, and it shows that hard work really does pay off. I do a lot of my own stunts. Despite Margot Robbie crushing it as Harley, she will be taking a break from the character as she finds her exhausting, but hopefully we're not left waiting for too long for her to perform insane stunts and forget that Bloodsport's name isn't Milton again.